So we're rounding out the series. We're finishing it up, and it's called The Tribe of the One. Of, of the One. And if you're just like clueless and you didn't get it uh, throughout the entire message series, um, we're a tribe because we're a group of people uh, that we gather here each and every Wednesday night, and we follow a leader, not me, not Drew, not Morgan, not your life group leader. We, we follow Jesus. He's the one. He's what brings us all together. And we've been walking through the Bible and looking at different passages in the Bible that that tell us uh, what it means for us to be a tribe, what describe, how the Bible describes community for us, how the Bible describes how we're supposed to act towards each other, how the Bible describes tonight how we're supposed to dream great big things for God together as a group. And that's where we're gonna be tonight. If you have your Bible, find Psalms 139. If not, it'll be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, you can, you can come ask me or ask your, or ask your life group leader. But um, earlier this week, as I was just praying for you guys and just kind of thinking about this message and how I would bring it together, I was looking at some things on the internet and I saw one of these things, I just typed into Google, um, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Because we're talking about future tonight, or your future tonight. Uh, and the first hit, the first, top, the first thing on the top of the page was one of those aptitude tests. Anybody ever taken an aptitude test, right? It's supposed to tell you what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you should be when you grow up. And I was like, hmm, I'm grown up, but I'm gonna take this test and see what it tells me. Right, And so I start clicking through uh, the questions and answering in them. There were about 30 questions and it gets to the end and it's got this hourglass thing and it's telling me that the computer's thinking about it, processing all of my information on the World Wide Web and it's about to tell me what I should be when I grow up. And I'm like, huh, this is gonna be awesome because I'm already grown up and I'm already doing something, but I wanna see uh, what the internet says I should be when, when I grow up. And it comes up, it flashes up on the screen, it tells me that I should be a banker. <laughs> right? And there's a couple of problems with that. I'm not a banker. Uh, I don't think I ever wanted to be a banker when I was a child. Um, uh, I'm, it, it says, it, I think in the first line of the paragraph, it says, since you are great with math, you should be a banker. I'm not great with math. Uh, I don't really like adding things together uh, and, and all these things. And I'm like, how in the world did you get from the questions that I answered that, that I should be a banker? And more, more, more importantly, how is it so off? And I know many of you, especially some of you seniors in high schools, juniors in high schools, you think about college and where you're gonna go. Um, you, aptitude tests are great. They're, they're good to help us understand what we're good at. And obviously this one just was a bad test. Right? So I don't, want to, I don't want to discourage you if, if somebody wants you to take an aptitude test so that you could maybe see some things about you and what you're good at. But the best possible thing that you could do uh, is, is ask God what you should do with the rest of your life. The best possible thing that you could do is spend some time in the word of God, learning to hear his voice, asking Jesus, God, what did you create me for? When you think about your future, This world is gonna ask you and encourage you to take things like tests and to to discover different things about you and they're gonna wanna leave God out of the equation. And my prayer and my, and my heartbeat is that you would learn to, to, listen to, the, to listen to the voice on the inside, the Holy Spirit who's active in your life, that voice, and, and begin to think about your dreams and your desires and your future in such a way that includes God and allows him to speak to what he thinks about your future. And so when we're thinking about your future and when we're thinking about when you grow up, maybe some of you go, oh, wait, I already know some things about my future, Chris. I wanna be rich. Anybody wanna be rich? Raise your hand, that's okay. Anybody wanna be rich? Yeah. All right, some of you are thinking, maybe, maybe I've got great aspirations for my life. If Donald Trump could be president, maybe I could be president. Anybody ever grow up thinking they wanna be president of the United States? My, my grandmother thought I was gonna be president of the United States. It's an okay, it's an okay desire to be. Here's the most serious question, because when I was in the third grade, this is really what I, what, I, what I wanted to be when I grew up, a garbage collector. Anybody, anybody were there? Who else wouldn't want to ride on the back of a truck and pick up things? And you see, when I was a kid, you rode, they rode on the back of the truck and they picked up your trash can and they threw it in and that looked awesome to me, right? But it's obvious that things change over time because when I got a little bit older, I didn't want to be a garbage collector anymore. 
And so what I want us to do tonight, when we're thinking about our future and we're thinking about what we wanna be when we grow up and we're thinking about and trying to process some things like that, rather than us take an aptitude test, Thomas, wait for life group, rather than us um, try to just kind of just talk about a lot of things, why don't we go to the word of God and see what the word of God has to say about our future, about the way we're made about what we should do, what we should wanna be when we grow up. And I want you to find a verse, maybe you've heard it before, it's in Psalm 139, one verse, let's read it together. David says this, hey, God, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O oh God, my soul knows it very well. Anybody heard that verse before? Maybe your parents have read it to you. Maybe they read it over you when you were being dedicated. If you put your Captain Obvious hat on, David starts by reminding us that there's a big clue right there in the first three words. I highlighted it for you. I praise you. And I want you to hear this tonight. It's not the focus of the message and we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but you discover a whole lot about yourself. You discover a whole lot about your identity. You discover, you will discover a whole lot about what you wanna be when you grow up through worshiping God, right? It is at, it was what you were made to do. Oh, some of you, like Rob Quirk, were, were, were made for, for, for things that, that, I mean, Rob knows Latin and math and all kinds of things. He amazes me with his brilliance, right? Well, Rob was made for, for, for just to be brilliant. I, I, I just can't even tell you how smart that guy is. But, but before, more than that, he was made to worship Jesus. And so I gotta start there because David starts there. And I need you to understand this tonight. You can't start talking about your future, whether you're in sixth grade, whether you're in 12th grade, or even my future as a 42-year-old without starting where David started and he starts with worship. He says, God, I wanna, I wanna praise you because I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you see, I, I need you to do that because you see, remember last week we started talking about some things that, that sometimes I don't always encourage you guys as your pastor in the right way. And I just have to tell you that the worship that I just saw was not people who were in awe of God. Not people who could say this very same thing. Because there's a lot of people in the room that are just kind of standing there wondering why we sing three songs before Chris comes and talks at us. And my heart is that you guys would learn to love to worship Jesus. And sometimes I just have to be a shepherd in your life and say, you know what? The Bible, and in, in, in on every page it talks about Jesus, and really on every page it talks about how we have to center our hearts and our minds around Jesus, and we call that worship. Whether it's singing songs, whether it's reading the Bible, or whether it's giving him our very lives, we, we gotta be people who say, God, I praise you, I worship you. If you need him to answer a question that you've been asking him, maybe you've been asking him for a while, you need him to show you something clearly, you want him to do something amazing in your life, I just wanna encourage you to start where David starts. He said, God, I wanna, I wanna worship you. If you're one of those people that we were praying for a minute ago and you got a lot of tests and, and some concerns, I, I wanna encourage you tonight to maybe go into your room, ask your parents if, 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 you, need to, if you need to to close the door and just spend some time with, with your phone and, and some worship music. Turn it on airplane mode so you don't get any text, don't get any Snapchat, and just spend some time worshiping Jesus over those tests and just give God some room and see what he does. If you're struggling in some relationships with some friendships, if your parents are fighting and, and it's a distraction to you, just start where David started, when he was wondering about his future, but he started by saying, God, I praise you. Some of you need to get back to that basic of worshiping Jesus, singing out loud. But there's, there's another dot that we need to connect and it's right there in the middle of, of the verse. David says, I'm fearfully and I'm, I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Okay, and when he says I'm fearfully made, he's not talking about scary movie type of fear. He's talking about awe and wonder. Like if I, if I got us all on an airplane and I took us to Niagara Falls, some of us would see it and the amount of water that's kind of dumping over the edge, I've heard, I've never seen it with my own eyes, I've heard that when you're there, you're like, oh wow. I, I've seen a video, I've heard somebody talk about it, but when I'm, when I'm here and to see the amount of water that's coming over this, I guess it's like a rock, uh, it's coming over and, and it just falls and it crushes anything below it, oh wow. You see, that's what David's saying when he says, I'm fearfully made. It's like an oh wow. Like I'm in awe of who God is when I, when I think about how I was made. 
But he also says, I'm wonderfully made, all right? And to understand that, I need you to connect one other dot. It's this last phrase in the verse. He says, I'm wonderfully made, and my, my soul knows it very well. And so what David wants us to understand, what God's speaking to us through the verse is that like deep, deep down inside, every one of us have, have this seed that God placed there that's supposed to sprout and you're supposed to, to get it one day, kind of like a light bulb that turns on in a comic when the guy understands something that, oh, deep down inside, God's planted this, this seed of faith that when I realize it one day, I'm going, oh my goodness, not only, not only am I in awe of God, but I was created to wonder. I was created to be in amazement. It might help, help you if I, if I tell you what the definition of wonder is. It's, feeling, it's a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful or unexpected or unfamiliar. Get, catch this, it's a desire to be curious, to know, some, to know more about something. It's a feeling of admiration or amazement or marvel. I want you to process this in life group tonight. How many of you have ever stopped and marveled at the way that you were made? How many of you have ever stopped um, to, to wonder, you know what? The Bible says that deep down inside, I should be amazed at how God made me. Some of you are like, you know what? I don't like the way God made me. I don't like my hair color. I don't like my eyebrows. I don't like my shape. I don't like how tall I am. I don't like how short I am. But, but David's telling us that deep down inside, God planted something there so that when you would look at the mirror and you would see yourself, you would go, wow, God is awesome. And there's something unique about me that God wants to use in this world to accomplish his will, to accomplish his desire, something to be amazed at. I think we also might need a little bit more help. So let me be clear. If you're going, yeah, it's about time somebody get on board with how awesome I am. Yeah, it's about time that somebody see how cool I am. Chris, thank you very much. I've needed all day for somebody to acknowledge that I am legit and I, I, people should be focused on me. Then, then you're missing the point. That's not what I'm saying tonight. I mean, probably you are awesome, but, but that's not what the verse is saying. It's talking about the way that you were made, and it's not actually talking about the biology part of the way in which you were made. And if you know what that means, you need to go home and ask your mom. But it's talking about the way that God designed you. And you see, some of you go, you know what, God, I got to you struggle in your relationship with God because when you look in the mirror, you're not really happy with that. And, you, and the, the first hurdle that you have to overcome to actually knowing what you were created to do on this earth, actually discovering what your future is, is acknowledging that God designed you and he made you the way you are and he did it on purpose and he's actually happy with it. God didn't make a mistake when he made you the way that he made you. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say that out loud? God didn't make a mistake. God didn't make a mistake. Look at your other neighbor and say, God didn't make a mistake. You see, I'm hoping, you see, I'm hoping, guys, listen, that that seed that's planted deep down in your heart, that David said, because your soul knows it very well, will actually start to sprout tonight, and you'll be in admiration and marvel at the way that God made you, because he designed you. And you see, none of you are old enough, none of you have lived on this earth long enough to think that there's something actually really wrong with you. None of you are old enough, none of you are, have lived long enough to actually go, God, you made a mistake with the way that you made me. I'm not good at math, God, you made a mistake about that. None of you are old enough and live long enough to be able to actually have evidence to prove God it was wrong, even though he wasn't. And what I want you to realize is that some words need to be taken out of your vocabulary. Some of you need to stop speaking things out loud about yourself. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that tonight because there is a truth that your soul knows deep. It's so deep sometimes that you don't even know it's there and that God wants you to be in awe of the way that he made you. 
And some of you might be missing opportunities to talk to somebody in your third period class or in your fourth period class or at the lunch table because you're so caught up in criticizing yourself, you can't be in awe of how God made you. You see, there, there, are, there are great big dreams that God wants you to be dreaming and living in. And I know it's true because it's in, it's in his word. Check this out. Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, he said, he said it pretty clearly to us. He said, as it is written, what no eye has seen or no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Please don't miss this. It's really clear. He's saying to us, hey, no eye has seen, no ear has heard the, the kinds of things that God wants you to live in. And you might be thinking, you know what? I just hope I don't, don't have to grow up and be that garbage man. I just hope I don't have to grow up and do this. But guess what? It doesn't matter what your job is. God's got a plan for you. And it's gonna be so remarkable as you live into it that you would be able to describe no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God has planned for me. But you see, we struggle to realize that. And you're gonna struggle to realize that regardless of what your age is. And Paul actually tells us in the next verse, in verse 10, why we struggle. Because he said, these things, these plans that God has for us, they have to be revealed to us. And they're revealed to us through the Spirit. Check this out. For the Spirit searches everything. That's why God knows everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And he knows what college you're going to go to. And he knows what you're going to be when you grow up. And he knows who you're going to marry. And he knows how many kids you're going to have. Because he knows everything. It says the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So we've got this friend out there, the Holy Spirit. And God's given him as a gift to you and to me and to all of us to speak things to us so that we can know what, our, know what, what, what we're supposed to be when we grow up, know who we're supposed to marry, know more things about our future. Not like look at a crystal ball and go, oh, wow, I'm supposed to, to on this day, wear this color of shirt so I bump into this guy, but, but to know about your future, about what God wants you to walk into. Shake your head with me if, that under, if you understand that. But a lot of times we spend a whole lot more time listening um, to, 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 to Taylor Swift and Jay-Z than we do in, in the Bible, listening and learning how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit spend more time on Netflix or on YouTube than understanding how the New Testament speaks to us about these dreams and these desires that God has kind of planted in your heart as this seed, and it's just ready to, to flourish because the Holy Spirit's gonna reveal some, some, things, some things to you. I've been praying that tonight that happens. But I want you to focus in life group on tonight on, on really four things that get in the way of us listening to the Holy Spirit. And they're not really profound. They're not really deep theological things. They're actually really practical things that I think as I was just praying and asking the Lord uh, this week, what are things that, that you guys, whether you're 12 or 18 years old, often struggle with that get in the way of, of hearing the voice of the Lord and hearing what God might wanna say to you about your future. And you see, um, I think the first thing that really gets in the way is wishing that you had someone else's life. Right? You, walk up the, you walk up and down the halls at your school, you sit with a group of friends, you have a group of people that you really, really love, and you're always, always, always wishing that you had their life. You're like, man, if, if, I had, if I had that family, if I had that much money, if I was that smart at math, that smart at Latin, right, Rob? Then, 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 I, then I wouldn't have these problems. You're always wishing you had somebody else's life. And if you find yourself in that place, I can almost guarantee you that you're, you're not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you're actually listening to your voice. And you see, God wants you to, to, to realize that the loudest voice in your head will usually always win. And some of you, the loudest voice in your head is you saying, man, I wish I had somebody else's life. You see, I have you guys repeat things over and over again with me, not just so that you'll stay engaged, but that's one of the reasons, but I have you repeat things because you know what, you hear me once a week, but you're, you're the loudest preacher in your life. Like, oh, Chris, I didn't know I was a preacher. Yes, you, yes, you are. 
And whether you say it out loud or whether you say it silently, you are saying, some of you are saying over and over again to yourself, I wish I had someone else's life. I wish I looked like that guy so I could get that girlfriend. I wish I looked like her so I could get that guy. I wish I, I had that family or I was that smart so I could get into that school so I didn't have these problems. And all the while, God's like, you know what? I'm pretty happy with the way I made you. I don't, I don't need you to wish you had somebody else's life. And some of us need to realize that, that the, a big crucial key to understanding what God wants you to do in the seventh grade or your freshman year in college is to stop wishing you had somebody else's life and to start listening to the Holy Spirit. I had an awesome, awesome opportunity through a couple of scholarships and I, unfortunately like a lot of student loans to go to Baylor. Um, my family, some of you guys think you're poor because you just haven't had the latest upgrade in, in, the, in, in the iPhone. My, my family, we, we grew up poor, right? There's some people, you know, what poor is. Um, come talk to me. If you don't know what poor is, I can tell you. And uh, my freshman, sophomore, and junior year had, had no car. But my senior year, my dad did something amazing and somehow scrapped together some money. That's one of, one of the reasons why he's my hero. And he bought me a car for about three or 400 bucks. It was a 1974 Plymouth Champ, okay? And just so that you understand how old this car is, I was born in 1974, so each year this car got older, um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was my age. And, and, and so I was, uh, the summer, that, the first summer that I drove that around here in San Antonio, it was awesome. But it ceased being awesome the day I had to drive it to Waco and be surrounded by all of these people who have all of this money who go to this school that's known for people who have a lot of money who go to this school. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And you see, for, this, for most of the summer, my car was awesome. But when I started to compare my life with all these other people at Baylor, I started to resent that car. I quickly forgot that for my freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I'd either walk, ride my, bu ride my bike, or ask, uh, ask somebody for a ride. And I started comparing myself to these people and, and I started resenting this car and wishing that I had somebody else's life. And yes, my mom and dad are some of my heroes, but I started wishing I had some other parents, some other people who could have, who could have planned a little better for their lives so, that, so that, uh, that maybe I could have a little more. And these, these, these places of bitterness started settling in in my heart. And, it, and it's silly, but I would start walking to class again. I wasn't gonna drive that car around anywhere. You see, some of you need to realize that wishing you had somebody else's life is placing this, this root of bitterness in your life and it makes, you, makes it really, really hard for you to hear the voice of the Lord so that you can know what you're supposed to do in the eighth grade, ninth grade, freshman year in college, when you graduate, or for the rest of your life. But there's a second way in which we get in the way and I think that, that a lot of you need to hear this tonight. You preach to yourself, I'm, I'm not good enough. For Mother's Day, we got Anne Marie, um, the, the, the movie, The Greatest Showman. It's one of our favorite movies at our house, uh, right? And, and when no one's watching, I love to sing. When, when no one's watching, I, I like to try to dance. I'm not gonna try to do that on the stage because, because I know I'm not good enough. But when I'm by myself, I'm good enough. I, when I'm by myself, I start to think, you know what, maybe, maybe I've got a little bit of rhythm. But then I get around some people who've got rhythm and I realize again that I don't have any rhythm. And when we say that you start to preach to yourself you're not good enough, that's not what we're talking about because I can legit say I'm not a good dancer. If you stand next to me in worship, you can go, Chris, I would affirm you can't sing. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is an identity issue. You never wanna try something new. You never wanna be challenged by a group of friends. You never wanna push the envelope and see what else you could accomplish in life because you're always saying to yourself loud and proud, I'm not good enough. And you need to hear this clearly, guys. It's not, it, it is a sin because God is, God is in love with the way that he made you. He destined you to accomplish certain things. And some of you are like, you know what? I'm just not good enough for that. And God's like, oh, excuse me? I made you the way that I made you and you are good enough. Oh, you're a sinner. Oh, you needed, you needed Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. But, but, but you see, God's gonna supply all the strength, all the grace, all the wisdom like we prayed at the very beginning that you need. And you, you are good enough to accomplish those amazing things that God has designed for you to accomplish. 
Listen to me clearly. Some of you need to remove I'm not good enough from your vocabulary. Maybe some of you, as this school year ends, you need to decide, you know what, I am, I am running for student council next year. I, I am gonna wanna be a part of that club or try out for that sport or be a part of that thing because what's been holding you back for a season is you've been saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not good enough. Some of you, you've relegated yourself to sitting in the corner in the lunchroom because you say, I'm not good enough. I could, I could never go join those people. Why not? Some of, some of you, 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 you go, you know what, I, I could never talk in life group because people might think I'm a fool. You, you're saying to yourself, I'm not good enough. I'm just praying some of you will let that, that light bulb click on. Remember David said, your soul knows these things deeply and you would reject a lie that says you're not good enough and, and you just might give Jesus room. Yeah, I, I realize that some of you have, have some things that somebody in this world would call a disability. God made you and he designed you the way that he designed you and you are, you, he, he is going to accomplish things in your life in spite of that and with it. And you gotta remove, I'm not good enough from your vocabulary. This summer, we're gonna be starting um, with, with Drew and Morgan's help, uh, a, a, student, a student leadership group. Some of you say, you know what, maybe, maybe at school, that's a little too difficult step for me, Chris. But in this place, it's always a safe place. And God can, God can use you here in this place, just like he could use you on a student council, just like he could use you on a football team. All you gotta do is just step up and wanna, and wanna be a part. Two more and then you're gonna head to life group. Some of you say constantly and consistently, uh, I have no friends, no one likes me. You see, the worst part of this is, is I've, as I've walked around and listened to some of you guys, you don't just think this, I've heard some of you say it. And I want you to hear me clearly because I realize that you guys are growing up in a place where people are just mean to each other. And I don't get it sometimes. And so it is, it is likely that at your school and maybe even here at Ablaze that somebody doesn't like you. But it's not true that nobody likes you. To risk the most cheesy line in the world, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. I like you, so you know at least one person that likes you. But more important than that, what I want you to hear tonight is that some of you speak lies about yourself. Whether it is that I have no friends and no one likes me, or that I'm ugly, or that I'm too fat, or I'm this, or I'm that, you speak lies, and some of you say them out loud with your mouth. And those lies then become true belief in your mind. And you need God to change your heart and to change your vocabulary. And I, I said it that way tonight because some of you need to realize that maybe you, maybe you hack some people off at school. And there is a group of people that are five or 10 people that really don't like you. That's true. But stop saying, no one likes me. I have no friends. Because that's not true. A hundred people at school could not like you and it's still not true. Half the school could not like you and it's still not true. And I need you to train. I'm praying, I'm praying that Jesus would speak to you, that that light bulb would go off, that truth that God planted deep down in your soul would go off tonight and you would stop speaking lies out loud about yourself. Because there are people here in this world that like you. There is somebody here that wants to be your friend. And maybe, just maybe, what God wants you to realize tonight is that there are seasons where some of us go, go through things where we feel alone, where we feel like no one likes me, where we feel like I have no friends, because God wants us to walk through that to open our eyes to maybe a new group of friends or to somebody else who wants to be a friend, who God wants you to use you to be a friend to. But you gotta stop saying no one likes me, I've got no friends, in order to accept the truth of that. And, and Drew told you at the very beginning, and I want you to remember that Drew, me, Morgan, your life group leaders, nobody makes more, more, any more money if more people come to our, our kickoff on June 10th than five people. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get the same paycheck. Drew's gonna get the same paycheck. So it's really not about us having a lot of people there. But I want you to dream a dream with me for a second that if everybody in this room went and found somebody at their school or on their street or, or maybe even at church that doesn't come to life group regularly, went and found somebody who you know thinks that no one likes them, 
We wouldn't have to rent just one bus. We wouldn't have to rent just two buses. We'd have to rent about five or six buses both ways. And maybe, just maybe, you have some of those feelings right now. And maybe, just maybe, you got mad at me when you said, when, uh, when I said, it's not true that no one likes you. You're like, oh, no, Chris, you don't know my school. People don't like me there. I'm all by myself. Well, that's a lie. And maybe, just maybe, God has you in a season so that you, you'll reach out to somebody. and go, hey, my youth group's going to this crazy thing. You want to come? My youth group's going to go spend, spend, a couple of hours out of Guadalupe State Park. You don't want to jump in the river. You don't have to jump in the river if you don't want to, but you wouldn't want to have a hot dog. You wouldn't want to just hang out with people. Maybe God's walking you through that season so that you could reach out to somebody. It doesn't have to be the kickoff. Maybe it's just that you're going to put your arm around them and sit with them at lunch tomorrow. Maybe it's just that you're going to talk to them. Maybe it's that you're going to take a big step of faith and ask them, um, how could I pray for you? And the last one is we prepare to go to life group. And I, I need you to think, turn your brain on. I know I've been talking at you for about 20 minutes now, but, but if, you're, if you're not listening anymore, check back in because I need everybody to hear this. So sit up straight and focus on those two words. Defeat versus victory. Because you see, um, I need you to turn your brain on because I need you to, have to upgrade your vocabulary and your way of thinking. And you see, I want you to hear me clearly that a blaze and this place and your life group will always, always, always be a place where you can talk about your needs and your hurts and the things that you struggle with. It will never cease to be a place like that. But some of you are maybe, just maybe, I hope you can understand this, are like killing your life group because each and every Wednesday, all you got is like blah, 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 blah. You have the worst week, the worst life, the worst year, the worst this, the worst that. And maybe, just maybe, it isn't really that bad. And you're, you're thinking about life from a place of defeat instead of a place of victory. Because you see, guys, Jesus didn't just die so that you could go to heaven. He died so that we could find victory. And so tonight, maybe tonight, some of you, before you open your mouth in life, you're going to go, you know what? It's been about 18 life groups before I've told a good story. So unless I can say something good, I'm not gonna talk at all tonight because I need God to change the way I think, to stop thinking about defeat and to start thinking about victory. And it's okay tonight, maybe in life group, if you go, hey, I, I can't share, but you remember that defeat victory thing that Chris was talking about? I'm just gonna raise my hand. You guys need to pray for me so that next week I'll have a story to tell about a victory. Does that make sense? Shake your head with me if you understand. Change your vocabulary, change the way you think. Don't do, no longer think about life from a place of defeat, but think about life from a place of victory. And that's not just Chris, your youth pastor saying that. Check out the way that Jesus, and we're coming to a close, said this. He said, the thief, that's Satan, he comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I came that you may have life and have it abundant. Guys, it's all in yellow because red didn't look good. Um, and yellow, it's all in yellow because it's Jesus speaking this. And Jesus isn't just talking to the disciples. He's talking to some people who believed in him. And he's talking to some people who didn't believe in him. And he wants them to understand clearly that the thief comes to kill and destroy. And if your life is always characterized by defeat, then more than likely you're listening to the enemy a whole lot more than you're listening to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean I think that you're demon-possessed. Don't go home and go, oh, Chris thinks, thinks that I, uh, I, I'm, I'm listening to Satan. No, but maybe, because maybe he just comes up to you, next to you, by just convincing you, you need to look like that person or act like that person or talk like that person. But Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And that's the voice that we need to be listening to. How do I know that? Check out the way Jesus ends this, ends this phrase, ends these two phrases. He said, I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, Jesus wants us to clue into the fact that it cost him his life to use the word abundantly to describe yours. I hope you get that. Will you listen to me? It cost Jesus his life so that he could describe your life with the word abundantly. 
Jesus. Sometimes we wish we had somebody else's life and we compare our life to theirs. Sometimes we, we, we think bad of ourselves, that God, God should have created us or made us different. Sometimes this, sometimes this. And Jesus is like, no, I died so that you could use the word abundant to describe yours. I was at the store the other day, and we'll close with this. I mean, I got some for you guys to have in life group, so you don't have to ask for mine. These firework Oreos. And I'm already over time, so I'm gonna make this fast. Right? And I was like, I've never seen firework Oreos. I don't know if you've ever had Pop Rocks. It's like in, inside the cream is the popping candy. I'm like, dude, I gotta try those out. So I went home. First thing I did, you can already tell, is uh, opened one up and, and popped it in my mouth. And I'm disappointed to tell you, nothing happened. I'm like, what? There's no firework explosion in my mouth. So then Sarah Grace and I did, ate an Oreo the way you're supposed to eat an Oreo. We twisted off the top and we took some of that stuff right there. And I let it sit there on my tongue for a second. And what do you know? It starts to pop. It starts to have this explosion in my mouth. There's fireworks happening right now. You see, the sweet spot that we're talking about, the cream in the middle is God's word, teaching and leading us to life. And I'm praying that tonight you heard some sweet, sweet things. And that one of those things that might be getting in the way of you hearing God's voice, you'd be able to recognize and go, you know what, Jesus died. So I, I would know I am good enough. Jesus died so that I would know that I no longer have to believe that lie about me, myself. Jesus died so I could use the word abundant to talk about my life. Jesus died so I could experience way more. Jesus died so I didn't have to just take an aptitude test to know about my future. I could trust him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for my friends. Thank you for these students that I love, and I pray that the sweetness of your word would wash over their hearts and their minds. You would help us. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for going over. Would you, would you help us in the next 20 minutes move quickly to some conversations that will change the way that we're thinking right now. Reboot our vocabulary. Bring life to our hearts and our minds and help us enjoy some Oreos. We love you, Jesus, and you're gonna be praying and believe.